they recognize that they are weapons and that they were made to be used to kill other things and to destroy other things and they've made peace with that as they've grown into who they are. And you notice that like when we talk about them in the books, we never have them bothered by the whole deal of them being abducted. They're almost always looking at that as, well, if it didn't happen, there wouldn't be a human race to protect anymore. And so there's a, a really deep sort of gravity to their understanding of being a Spartan, to their recognition of the weight of that, and to just the fact that they, they're embracing it as their destiny. This is what I was made for. This is what I was born to do. They're not seeing it as a situation where they were given a you know, short change. Um, they're seeing it as this is, this is the way it was supposed to be. And so their attributes are solemn acceptance. They, almost all of them have this sense of, we're here, we're gonna die one day, and it may be tomorrow, it might be 10 years from now, it's gonna happen, it'll probably happen in battle, but we're gonna, we're gonna do what we've been called to do uh, until that happens. This is about Master Chief's journey, his past and his future. For Chief, it's interesting because he's reunited with Blue Team and this is the first time that we're seeing him actually rely on other people and be a part of a unit. There's also someone else looking for answers, searching for him. On the flip side, you've got Fireteam Osiris, who's a brand new team. They've never really fought together before. And I guess there's a parallel there for, you know, kind of where we were at with Halo 4. There's the fact that we built a studio and made a game at the same time. That's pretty crazy if you actually knew like what that entails. Next year will be 20 years for me in the industry and the stories I heard on the airport. I think a lot of us did and I definitely felt a lot of pressure. The bar was so high and nobody believed that we could do it and so it was kind of up to us to prove everybody wrong. We brought in these amazing talented people to make a game but they never worked together before. They're working with new ingredients in a kitchen they're not familiar with, and so there was kind of a craziness that came about from all that. Like I don't know how it happened. You know, all of the things that could be against a team or against a team. We had to earn um, the right to, to carry that Halo mantle. And I think that when you are in games and when you're in entertainment, um, there is no sure thing. We've got this big galaxy-spanning story. Oh, there's these, there's these attacks that are happening on colonies. There's this massive destruction that's happening. Somebody stop it, somebody save the day. But at the heart of it is, again, the story of these two families and these two things that they want. And if you don't have those quiet little human stories, it doesn't matter how many planets you blow up, nobody's gonna care. <laughs> Anyone can get lucky once. This is our sophomore effort. This is where we prove whether, we're, whether we can really pull Halo off. Mechanics, systems, fiction, and world. There's many other bubbles we could talk about, and maybe in the future we will, but these are the ones I want to focus on today. We started really big. You know, new platform, can do anything. For those of you that have been in a platform transition, it's not easy. That changes a lot of things. It changes your technology, your tools, your pipeline. We didn't want to do things that kind of fit into the mold of existing Halo. But it's mostly opportunistic. It was more, what can we do to continue to evolve the franchise? So there was a lot of like, how does Halo fit into this new platform? What are things that we can do now that we could never do before? So everything that we're doing is about trying to bring innovative new experiences that take advantage of Xbox One and showcase the unique capabilities of that experience. We had our whole team rolling off of four. We wanted to engage everyone in coming up with new ideas. We had a couple hundred people all pitching things on what the next game could be. So we had to start massive, fail, fail, fail. We failed a lot until we kind of came up with spaces that we were happy with. For us, a lot of what we spent this time on was just kind of figuring out what the long-term roadmap for the studio and for the technology. I'm looking at how do we make sure we keep ahead for making sure that we're moving forward to make our engine, our tools, the best for our creative teams. With the way that we're doing it, we're continuing to develop tech, but at the same time, we need to kind of start working on the next project. And so every one of those decisions you make is taking little chunks out of the end game from somebody. Weapon, sandbox, environment, like, you know, whoever's doing the work on that, they're not doing other work that could go into gameplay. Maintaining the balance between what Halo is and what Halo could be or should be or needs to be. 
but you got to. Like, you know, we can't, the engine was made, you know, 15 years ago. There's things in this thing that we, that we should tear out and rebuild from scratch. It was a ton of creative minds coming together and trying to figure out what we could do with a new platform, what we wanted to do with gameplay, what we wanted to do with story. So between four and five, we had some time and it was the right time in the marketplace to go, okay, we need to go 60 frames a second. We need to go dedicated server. And if we're ever going to do those, we got to do them now. Every other Spartan, every soldier, when they hear about this, they're going to hate us. There is a certain limitation that you've got when you've got one character that's sort of driving the universe. You'll actually be playing as our new Spartan, Spartan Locke, as well as Master Chief and Blue Team. We need to answer that question of who else out there is a badass, and who else out there is somebody you'd want to play as. We wanted somebody who had a very distinct contrast to the Master Chief. It's more interesting when Chief has Maybe not an antagonist, but kind of a wild card. He's gonna go try to capture the hero of the story. I'm not so much hunting a spark as I'm hunting the spark. How do we find a way so that Locke is just doing his job? Chief has always been very much shoot first, ask questions later. And while Locke is not slow on the trigger finger at all, he usually knows why he's shooting a little bit more than Chief does. That's an interesting perspective there, because traditionally the Master Chief has always been just follows whatever orders you tell him to do. How do you put that question on its head? Use characters in ways that we may not have expected and, and might be even uneasy using them. You pit him against the groups that he would normally be aligned with. Chief's always been a man apart and has always been very, very different than other people around him. But with Blue Team, these are equals. And so getting him the chance to talk to these people that he's known for years means that we get to see another side of him. There is a unique understanding that the rest of Blue Team has that even Cortana really didn't have. A, they've shared the same experiences of augmentation and being ripped from their home and growing up without their parents. And so I think that there's a different kind of bond there. Chief's with his old team, people who were his family, people he knows very well. Locke is the leader of a new team, so they have a completely different dynamic. They're all been drawn from backgrounds that can bring something to the team, as well as Spartan 4. Vale's knowledge of cultures. In fact, she can actually speak Sanhili and understand the nuances of the language even better than a lot of Sanhili themselves. Tanaka's knowledge of engineering. They got a lot of like sensing equipment or little radio transceivers and things like that. Buck's general badassedness. Check your mouths, find your chairs, and get set for a combat truck. He's kind of bolted on parts of his ODST gear. Let's roll out, Osiris. Made it. Yeah, safe and sound inside a crumbling building. We still got our big guy at the center of all of it. What would the answer be from Oni? Our Superman, our Spider-Man, like he's there. If some of their Spartans were to go off the reserve. But around him now, we've built the Avengers. Osiris is the answer. Let's talk about the creative pillars. The world is your playground is our first pillar. You want to make the mechanics that enable the most cool stories to, to happen. You can make the player feel really powerful, or you can make the guns feel really powerful. That's where Spartan Abilities really came online, where it was like, what about movement? What about the suit? We have all these different movement abilities. It changes all our metrics, our jump metrics, distance. It changes the flow of combat. How do you do an encounter if a character skips B and goes straight to C, and then comes back to B? How do you make that encounter interesting? We get to do more as artists. We get to build new ledges, build secret tunnels, things like that. Stuff that we might not necessarily do in a single player game. The term we always have internally is your, your team, team is your weapon. Your weapon. On my target. Engage the elite. They're not going to help them. On it. We always assumed there were four people. Even when people don't have a co-op partner to play with, we're putting the extra Spartans in there. I'm a longtime Halo fan, and every Halo I have felt had some big, big innovation. I would hope that people would look at Halo 5 and say, oh yeah, holy crap, Musketeers. They, they won't say Musketeers because that's our code name. I don't even know the origin of that. I think we just needed a term for our autonomous AI companions that kind of follow you through the campaign. We focused on the two fundamentals, the one being they're a well-integrated part of the sandbox. They'll play the game along with you, they'll fight with you, they'll revive you if you go down, revives the new mechanic in Halo 5. One of the big draws of Revive was we wanted to embrace that co-op game play, how could we get players to kind of stick together and work together more? And the other being orders, which I think is potentially a big innovation for Halo. Get in that vehicle. Move over to that spot. You see this too? Attack that enemy. Take that target on the ground. Pick up that weapon. Changing tactic. It's a balancing trick because you don't want the musketeers to be too effective. You don't want a player to be running around exploring the new Halo world 
and then the Musketeers kill everything. We still want the player to feel like the hero. We will have had two programmers spend the, the whole project on, on that problem. Enemy near that Give turret. the player some very simple set of capabilities. If you kind of tell them to rush up the middle, all the AI will kind of focus their fire on the Musketeers, allowing you to flank. And then the player's going to come up with ways of using it that we haven't even thought of. Maybe that's not innovation, but it's a crazy challenge. If that's a big risk across the team, I feel like we've taken 15 or 20 huge risks on a similar scale. It's huge. It's, it's super ambitious and big and crazy, but it's like half of what we started with. Halo 5, I think, to put it in a nutshell, was about not getting too comfortable with knowing we could make a Halo game. You can do it once. You can, you can do that crazy Halo 4 thing once, but you don't want to repeat that. You want to get better and better at making a Halo game. The confidence we've had in this project to take on some of the technical challenges. Just 60 frames a second would, would probably be enough to put on paper three years ago and have us go like, no, no way. There's a lot of work we're establishing infrastructure. We're making, you know, kind of laying the foundation that we're going to build on top of for the future, whether it's, you know, this game or whether it's the next game or whether it's something else down the line. And I hope people will look back and they'll say, oh, that's where that started. It can be a tough transition, it can be hard, but then once you have that path, then you, then you got it. Because I can see where we could go and where I want to go. There's definitely a human drama at the core of that, how these two teams relate to each other as they cross paths. It is about heroism, but not an individual heroism. It's the convergence of the player's abilities, the tools that they've picked up along the way, and then the situation that they're thrusted into. Halo's kind of got that in spades. I think we'll have done a good job if people are shocked at the end of the game and surprised by the direction that that took. I think the biggest question that Halo asks when someone grabs a controller and starts playing it is, how far can you push this thing?